Okay, so um, uh, we have gone through three lectures I pre-recorded in December and talked about uh, the introduction and then talk about the quantum concept uh, with particle duality, uh, especially single photon interference uh, concept uh, in the first uh, two chapters. Now I, see, uh, I want to talk about this uh, quantum mechanics uh, basics. Uh, but I don't want to make it uh, too complicated. I'm not going to teach you quantum mechanics. There's also a book talk about these things. What I'm trying to do is just to give you the basics and uh, state it clearly how uh, quantum mechanics uh, postulates principles and the mathematical formalism uh, form these quantum um, languages. So we learn these languages, then we use it to uh, to, to, to study atomic structure, uh, energy level, radiative transition. So I would just say how it quantum me mechanics basics. Uh, there's a lot of book, uh, especially one book by a French scientist, Cohen Dendergen, uh, is a very good book. And the, the notes I wrote is basically based on, on his book. So I have a copy of that, and you can check out from a li library. Okay. So, uh, for this, uh, let me quickly go through uh, th this uh, first uh, uh, 3.1. We call it a postulate. Postulate of quantum uh, me 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 mechanics. So there's a few things. The first one is why I keep hearing some noise. Um, the fir first one is the, the quantum state. Quantum state uh, is defined as the undisturbed motion, and uh, we um, the, the disturbed mo uh, sorry undisturbed motion of the system. Uh, the state is about the status of motion of the physical system. Uh, each undisturbed motion with information about energy, momentum, angular momentum, coordinates. Uh, Etc. Forms, uh, forms a state of the physical system at an instantaneous time. And uh, in quantum mechanics, mathematical formalism, we represent this by a state vector. You can write it as psi uh, t. And then with the, this, uh, the, this uh, uh, symbol, uh, Dirac invented this, call it a cat. Okay. I will come back to talk about why do, the, did he call it a cat. Okay, so that's the first thing. Quantum state vector is given by uh, psi t. Is this pronounced as psi or per, per, per psi? Psi. Yeah, the psi t. Uh, always, sometimes you can just write this cat uh, vector. And so this is the, the first thing. Uh, after I write a few things, I will give you an example about this. Then the second one is uh, how about uh, these observables? The physical quantities, dynamical variables, they are the physical quantities that can be measured or observed. In quantum mechanics, if it's, it's a quantity not being able to be measured, they don't care. All they care is anything which can be observed or me measured. So this is called observables. Observables um, are represented uh, represented by a operator, by a linear or operator, and this symbol is a put a hat on it. So it's an operator representing observable, a physical quantity that can be measured or observed. And then uh, the next one, after you have a state, you have an observable uh, operator, which is linear. How do you re uh, represent me measurements, quantum me me measurement, quantum mechanics measurements? Okay, now I know where the noise is from. Whenever I write on this, I can hear some sound. Uh, 
it is represented by a linear operator A acting on a state vector psi. So it is e A act on psi. So psi in cat is the uh, state. The linear operator A act on this representing a measurement. And the only possible result, so the, the measurement results uh, I'll, I'll through the same measurement, yeah, sorry, measurement result can only be one of the eigenvalues of the corresponding observable A. Result is one of the eigenvalues. Of, of the observable A. Observable, uh, the, the real quantity is A. The linear operator is to represent it when you make a measurement. And the, the only result you can get is one of the eigenvalues. If you make many times of this measurement uh, onto the same state side, you can get different eigenvalues. But they have to be one of the, the, the eigenvalues. So this comes to the <coughs> uh, to a basic <coughs> equation. It's called the quantum mechanics eigenvalue equation. Okay. So this is defined as a linear operator act on this psi state. If it's an eigenvalue equation, it means you will get an eigenvalue times this same state. So originally, you probably don't feel this is very important. But actually, this is one of the major principles of quantum mechanics. Um, say if, <coughs> if a psi is not an eigenstate, so, so the, 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 in this case, in this special case, this is called the eigenstate. If it's not eigenstate, I make uh, a measurement on a state psi. Each time, I will get one eigenvalue, but they may not be the same. Could be lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. But if psi is an eigenstate, you make measurements many times, you only get the same eigenvalue. And that's called the eigenvalue uh, equation. And, and to be honest, this is the basic. When we are going in chapter four, talking about uh, atomic structure, what is atomic structure? We're talking about those energy levels. And each energy level is one eigenstate of uh, Hamiltonian uh, operator, which is the total energy of the, of the atom. So that one, actually, you should use eigenvalue equation. But in many quantum mechanics textbook, they wrongly call it, oh, you should go with the Schrodinger equation. Then make it not time dependent, and that way you get the eigenvalue. But this Cohen Tendergen's book emphasized that's two separate things. This is eigenvalue equation to help you to find out the eigenvalues and eigenstates while Schrodinger equation is to talk about the motion, how things evolve with time. Okay, so make sure we, we separate uh, these things. Um, I mean, I, I want to make it very clear with the distinguish these uh, concepts. Okay, so uh, before I go on, I, I'm a little bit uh, uh, worried about um, if I don't give you example, people will feel this is very boring. So let's, uh, let's, uh, document. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, in homework two, 
I trust some of you have submitted the homework, some still have not. I forgive you for now, but after since I come back, I hope then you guys will turn in homework in time. But the last homework you remember I was talking about figure out how to measure wavelengths, right? Our textbook, chapter four, talking about the spectroscopic instrument, it's really a nice one. Uh, summarizing many good uh, essential instruments, although they are not difficult, but it's uh, all these uh, optics concept. So please do read that. We won't be able to have time to go through that whole chapter. But if you have any question, any concern, any comments, come to me. I can discuss the you know that chapter with you. If you, because many of the instruments will be used in your future application. So one of them is the so-called Michelson, uh, Michelson interferometer, and that's one way to measure, to measure the uh, the the wave uh, The book probably gave you a, a a different drawing. This is a um, drawing taken from our own uh, instrument. Uh, it's one uh, a very precise uh, wave meter we bought from Berlin. Uh, instrument uh, many years ago, it's WA 1500. It's uh, uh, that um, this one, uh, the the 15 WA 1500. And now Bristol uh, company uh, reproduce these um, um, wavelength meters, make it more uh, faster. So how does this thing work? If uh, let's, let's go go through this. Uh, let's follow this. You have a beam come in. Either you use fiber or you can have a free beam goes in, okay? Um, a mirror steer that. So this is the, say it's your own beam, uh, unknown wavelength, you want to me measure it. You go in, this is a beam splitter, 50, 50 per, per percent, okay? Uh, let me get a, a pen for this. So this is a beam splitter, 50 to 50 percent. So your beam is equally split into transmitted beam and uh, re reflected beam. Yeah, in this case, you can only re reflect that way. Don't draw it, go to the other way. But sometimes we make this mistake, right? So 50% um, reflect here. This is something called a, a ritual reflector. They have exactly 90 degree angle. So no matter what angle you send in, the come out will be parallel, okay? So then the transmitted beam is reflected again, uh, both are reflected by another mirror. Goes here, goes here. So again, it's you, what angle you come in, you go, go out with the parallel beam. So then, uh, of course, you designed it this way. You have here, so it's your own beam, uh, reflected here, goes here, so goes there. This is with the uh, open triangle. And uh, the transmitted beam goes here, and then eventually, of course, you have to make these uh, two beam overhead spatially. So the two beam goes through different optical lines. Then when they reach here, they do interference. So how do you do uh, interference there? Well, we talked about that in the previous lecture, like uh, Young's double slit. What is the interference? Is it intensity superposition or it's amplitude superposition? Yes, exactly, it's amplitude superposition. So I have one beam come from this reflected part, another beam come from the transmitted part, and when you have the two beam amplitude, uh, two beam superposition, amplitude superposition, you can then uh, have um, you can then uh, have uh, interference pattern there. So if these two have the uh, coherent, uh, uh, I mean constructive interference, you see a bright fringe. If they have a destructive interference, which is exactly opposite phase, you cancel them out. So you get a dark, no light. So you will have. So when this this is a, uh, it's a ritual reflector on a reel, so you can move it very smoothly. While you are moving this, 
what is changing? The optical path here is changing. The optical path here, uh, I, I meant that the optical lens is n times d. Optical lens is changing. And with these two optical lens changing, their phase relationship is changing from constructive to partial constructive to destructive interference. So that way you will see many bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark uh, fringes. This is for your own beam. You wanted to measure unknown wavelengths. Of course, in Michelson interferometer, you must provide a reference hazard. And usually it's a Heaney hazard, single mode Heaney hazard, locked to iodine cell. Okay? So Heaney hazard locked to iodine cell. There's just many lines, these are well calibrated. So with this reference hazard, it's already locked, so people know the wavelengths very well from previous other, you know, many spectroscopic work. So this one go parallel with your input beam, just a slightly spatially offset. So also split, transmit, then the interference uh, to another uh, detector. So you have two photo detectors, detect, one det detector, you know, your unknown wavelength beam. The other one is the uh, reference laser beam. So when this retro reflector is moving along the rail, you are going to see fringes from both photo detectors. And actually, there's many, many, many fringes. You don't want just a few. Just a few, you have big arrow bars. You have many. So this movement usually at least a millimeter even centimeter, or maybe even tens of a cent, uh, centimeter. So someday I can give you guys a tour to Table Mountain. We have this uh, wavelength meter, and we can open it up. You will see this retro refractor is moving that way. Originally, it was made with a belt. So it works perfectly in laboratory, but I put it in airplane. <laughs> so even before I... You know, airplane, they start the engine, begin to have vibration. Then they see it doesn't work very well. I complained to Bernie. That's back in 1998. And then they said, send it back, we'll modify for you. So instead of belt, you know, belt is easy to have having trouble. They, they, they set rails. So once this one sits on the rails, you use a motor to move it. It's very stable. So it, even in uh, airplane, it can work, work, work well. So when you move this, these two uh, detectors will count how many fringes. Then you can calculate the unknown wavelengths from the reference uh, laser wavelengths and uh, the fringes numbers you counted from two de photo detectors. This is how it works. But let me ask you why. How, how does this thing work? I mean, how do you uh, de derive that? Have you con con considered that? So let's go to the, uh, you guys can still see this, right? Uh, somehow I hope I'm not going to block it. Okay, so, come on. So Michelson, Michelson interferometer as wave lens me meter, okay? I gave for the um, that uh, the diagram there already, and I I explained how it works. But now, can you figure out why you can do that way? So let's see. Um, you will have the interference fringes under what condi conditions? So. Uh, if I say, if I move this retro reflector by a distance d, then the beam comes in, goes out. So on this side, your optical path change would be what? Two times n refraction index times d. I put lambda there is because the refraction index is wavelength dependent. But this is for one optical path, right? This side decrease optical lens, this side would increase, and they, they should be equal. So that's why you actually double this. 
This is the optical wavelength chain. Uh, uh, not wavelength, sorry. Optical lens. Optical lens. Change. When this equals integer number of this unknown uh, wavelength, you should see that integer number of fringes. But the same, uh, so, so th th this is uh, for one equation. For unknown lambda. How about for the re uh, re reference laser? You should have the similar um, relationship. On this side, it will be m uh, naught times 0 naught. Uh, times uh, lambda uh, naught. What, what I meant is uh, lambda naught is for the reference laser. Reference uh, laser, of course, it has to have with known wavelengths, lambda naught. So I'm moving the same d. The geometrical d is the same. But the refraction index for two wavelengths could be different. In that case, it's 2 times n naught times a d. Then, uh, uh, again, because of the geometry, you double that. So that gives you, eh? why disappeared? So they give you 4 n lambda d equals m lambda lambda, 4 n 0 d equals m naught lambda naught. Am I blocking this? OK. Uh, so in th this case, what would you do to get the lambda? So you take the ratio between these two equations. D will be canceled out. 4 is canceled out. What would you remain? N lambda divided by N naught equals M lambda lambda divided by M naught M naught. So the unknown wavelengths lambda equals um, equals sorry equals lambda naught times n lambda divided by n naught times m uh, naught divided by m uh, lambda. Is that uh, clear? So so I see here why you do the, this way. Uh, in principle. You have another way. You don't need a, re a reference either, right? If you know the n lambda, you measure d precisely. You measure this uh, m lambda is the number of fringes when you travel d. You can get lambda. In principle, this is doable, right? But you need to consider accuracy. Lambda you want to measure to nanometer, 0.1 nanometer. Oh. I, I forgot to, 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 to say, for this laser, no, for, the, for this wavelength meter, it measures to, say, if we measure 744.1990 nanometer. This is the old WA1500. Now with the new um, uh, updated version, it can even measure to something like that. Just think about, can you measure D to that uh, accuracy in normal world? Not very easy. Even I gave you a caliber, you measure to point, uh, you, you can't even measure to my, my uh, uh, I mean, maybe one mi micrometer. But one micrometer, that's too bad here, right? So, so that tells you, um, so uh, that tells you, Although in principle it works, it's not a smart idea. So the smart idea is if you already hook the laser to some uh, either uh, molecular spectroscopy or atomic spectroscopy, you know the wavelengths lambda naught very well. Then you use this method, you cancel out the D. You don't have to measure D. As long as the two beams go the same uh, path, you cancel out the D. Then uh, n lambda, n naught, that still have to be pre-measured. So they have a lot of experiments that say under different humidity, temperature, pressure, how the refraction index of air change uh, with wavelengths. 
So they have these pre uh, calibration stuff. And then all the wavelength meter is doing is to measure the number of fringes. But you know the fringes is huge. So just to do a quick calculation, even D equals one centimeter, N equals one. Lambda is less than uh, one micron. You can calculate how many uh, fringes you have, thousands of thousands of fringes. So that's why when you have sufficient fringes number, now you do this calculation, you can get high uh, accuracy of the unknown wavelengths. And of course, how well you can do this also depends on how accurate and precise you know lambda now. And that's usually well calibrated uh, by many different uh, other methods. But for this, you see, there's one um, disadvantage of this measurement is you cannot make instantaneous measurement, right? You have to let this uh, ritual reflector move with time. So that's why uh, Michelson interferometer is suitable to measure CWB, continuous wave lasers. Uh, when the laser is stable uh, enough, but uh, you have to give uh, at least the second or sub-second in order to make one measurement, because you have to just move this, uh, go a, 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 a enough di 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 distance there. You won't be able to use a microsen to measure pulse the laser, right? If a pulse the laser is within one microsecond or something, you don't have, you, you haven't counted enough fringes. So in that case, um, that's why um, in, the, uh, in the homework I mentioned, for that, people usually want to use uh, fiber pyro et al. or FISO et al. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the detail of that. But basically, the idea behind that is in, instead of using time accumulating sufficient number of fringes, you now uh, distribute the fringes into spatial distribution. So you can have an instantaneous image of the fringes. Um, so FPI, FP, uh, ETA, or you can use the fetal uh, ETA. That's just a, a slightly different stuff. So FP is a two parallel uh, plate. Uh, Fizzle is uh, two, two flat plate, but you form a certain uh, uh, wedge and angle. So for this, when you have the beam go through, what you get will be things like that. Okay. So if I take uh, one side, I will see fringes like this. I mean, the, why did that disappear? Okay, let's try again. So it will be this, this, this. So these are, uh, one is equal spacing, which is fetal uh, at her. The other one, I, FPI, is not uh, equal spacing. But anyway, if you can take an instantaneous uh, uh, image of this, usually CCD camera or any modern camera allow you to do that. You can do these analysis, then that can also tell you the wavelengths. But of course, for that, again, you need a known wavelength. Do the same fringes. You compare, so two different set. Yeah, it's not easy for me to draw here. Say if another one have a different set here. You do some analysis of these interference stuff. You will, come on, how do I? Okay, then um, you can also calculate uh, the, the wavelengths of these uh, fringes and stuff. Okay, forget about that. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, uh, compare these two is Michelson, you use time to generate sufficient fringes. While FP, uh, et al., FISO et al., you use spatial distribution, get an instantaneous image. So that allows you to measure both pulse the laser and uh, CW laser.
But uh, if P at her, fetal at her, I mean, how accurate can they go? Uh, it's critically uh, depends on the alignment. Because if your reference beam and your um, real laser beam go in slightly different beam paths, you have the fringes shift a little bit or something. You will get precise measurements, but not accurate measurements. Precise means if you have sufficient signal noise ratio, your uncertainty is small, but you, might, you may have a systematic bias there. Okay. The reason I introduce this is I know these are very useful in all the optical uh, remote sensing stuff, especially in uh, LiDAR remote sensing. But the reason I'm talking about this is let's come back to here. So use the Michelson interferometer as an example. What states are we talking about? What would be called a state? What, what, what do you think? Which one? What, so how many states do we have here? Uh, Michelson is one of the few two-beam interference, right? So you have two states. Two states are the eigenstates, which is either you go the this transmitted path, that's one state. You, you re reach the photo detector. <clears throat> All the other one is the reflected part. That's the state two. They, they, <clears throat> they reach the photo detector. Um, so this is the, um, the quantum state of our ve vector. Uh, you can use this, uh, say it's the um, This is the, um, the quantum state, going one path for the photon, going another path for the fo photon. But from what we talked about in chapter two, you realize um, one interesting thing is, if I only shoot one single photon go through, what would you have? This photon, I mean, then at the photo detector. This is similar we are talking about. In chapter two, I used the double slate Young's interference experiment. That's also two beam interference, right? Okay. Uh, you you um, you move the, the, this. Um, you split the beam into uh, two uh, going through two side. But if you now send the beam uh, as a single photon, one by one, on the screen, you won't immediately see uh, interference, uh, interfer uh, interference patterns. Each time, the photon will strike at only one place on your screen. But if you have the same similar photons going repeatedly doing this, eventually they begin to merge these interference patterns. So for this, if I do not uh, change uh, this uh, uh, ritual re re reflector, say now it's a constructive interference, single photon send through, you will also see uh, uh, when you accumulate many photons, you will see they begin to have the interference fringes. But in this case, this is a little bit difficult to do such a single photon experiment because you need in time to accumulate that. And unlike Young's, uh, uh, interference uh, uh, pattern there. It's the spatial di distributed stuff. Okay. But anyway, this is a single photon passing through. It is actually um, becomes the superposition of a state. It will be, this single photon will be in both quantum state one and quantum state two. So when they reach the photon detector, it is the superposition of these two states. Then you can have interference there. So for this, uh, let me uh, jump um, about this a uh, little bit. Uh, I wanted to, um, where is this? Yes, here. Let me, let me jump a little bit. Right? Right? Oh, okay, so um, 
what is uh, interference here? Um, no, I realize I can't jump. I still have to. I can, oh, come back to talk about this uh, interference. But I think it's a problem. Let's, let's go back to this. Yes, OK. So this is, I give you an example. That's a quantum state, right? Uh, next, uh, let's continue to talk about the uh, postulation of quantum mechanics state and linear operator. Um, so here they define cat vector is this. And then a bra uh, vector is right th this. And they are Hermitian conjugate. Hermitian conjugate. That means this uh, bra equals uh, the conjugate of uh, of the of the cat uh, vector. So uh, on on this uh, now you probably understand why they call it a cat vector and a bra cat because put together it's a bracket. So bracket. You divide in the middle. The right side is a cat. The left side is a bra uh, vector. Um, so the scalar product uh, for these two uh, of the two cat vector. Say if uh, psi one, psi two, you want to take a, a, a scalar pr product. You have to take uh, using the uh, Hermitian conjugate of one of the vector, then get, get that that way. And uh, uh, when taking conjugate of a state vector, operator and constant, um, there's these rules, they are linear, uh, uh, linear uh, operator, so they obey these uh, rules here. And if, if a vector for the operator uh, equals its own uh, equals its own conjugate, then this one is called a Hermitian uh, operator. I, I trust some of you have learned quantum mechanics, so this is just to remind you. So the, then the, the other one is a, a com, commutator a relationship is defined using the square bracket. A, B is defined as A, B minus B, A, okay? So, uh, okay, so let's see the next one. Um, so this is uh, for the first uh, section. Oh, I, I, am I too fast, sir? Okay, so uh, 3.2 is the principle of superposition. Yeah, basically superposition is such an important, um, uh, important uh, such an important principle. So basically, quantum uh, mechanics principle of superposition of a state requires any state of a system can be considered as a superposition of two or more other states of the same same system. And indeed, this is have uh, infinite number. So in this case, um, what we want to do is say, let's say we have a, a complete orthogonal, uh, oh no, sorry, yeah, also normal, means orthogonal and normalized, also normal um, set of eigenstate. This is eigenstate, U N. So I use uh, um, the the this big bracket to represent it's a whole set. They have eigenvalue of A N. Then a linear operator. Uh, uh, so a linear operator U uh, N equals A N times U N because this is eigen uh, eigenvalue equation. You remember that. So um, the superposition principle basically say any state of this same system, psi, can be uh, expressed as 
the superposition of of this uh, uh, eigen uh, state, orthonormal uh, eigen state, U n with a coefficient C n in front of it. But then it's the superposition of them, so I take a sum here. This is for discrete energy levels. If it's um, continuously, you can write this uh, sum into uh, integration there. So it's all in my uh, lecture notes, so I'm not going to rewrite it here. How do you consider this? Basically, make an analogy, it's a Taylor expansion. Taylor expansion, you can expand any functions into one set of uh, some, uh, um, some uh, also normal uh, functions. So this is a similar uh, pr principle there. And then, so this is uh, part of this. Uh, this is a part of the superposition stuff. Then, of course, you can say uh, uh, that the next one would be the principle of spectral decomposition. Uh, decomposition. Okay, here I, I, I would say analogy to Taylor expansion. Would be, what would be a good analogy for spectral decomposition? This is to describe the probability of obtaining a specific eigenvalue of an observable operator while making measurements of a system in certain state, okay? What's the analogy on that? Fourier spectral analysis, right? So I would say an uh, analogy would be similar to uh, Fourier uh, spectral uh, uh, analysis. So what this is uh, to do is, uh, um, if I have this uh, Psi, can be written as a superposition of these eigenvalues um, state, then the probability of obtaining a non-degenerate eigenvalue a n is given by p represent the probability to obtain an a n equals what what you can do is use u n to take a, a scalar product square that and then normalized by this. So this, so when you have U n uh, interact with that, and uh, also normal. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say what does also normal mean. Also normal means. So also normal means. U uh, m, U n. They are all part of the, 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 uh, these things. They equals delta m n. Means if m equals n equals one. If m is not equal to n, then it's zero. So in this case, you you do this calculation, uh, substitute this one into this equation. Only when m equal when n equals m, you get this uh, one. All the others would be zero. So in this case, it's c n. This one equals uh, yeah. C n square divide divide by this. So the the the, the, the this psi times the psi, uh, the psi times the psi in the denominator is basically for normalization uh, purpose. This is for non-degenerate. If it's a degenerate, you have to write this to consider those uh, the degeneracy factor, which is in the actual notes. I'm I'm going to skip it here. And of course, you can expand this similar way from uh, discrete energy levels to continuous energy levels, which means you have to do integration instead of sum. Okay. The next one is uh, uh, for the pro pro projector operator. Okay. So uh, this is a useful relationship is uh, this, uh, this is two different uh, um, um, vectors, state vectors. But instead of taking the scalar product, when you write it in the, this way, this actually means a projector. 
Um, this is because when you have this thing work with, so if you have this worked on another state, uh, I, I use the AE to represent here. You can write this as psi times, and this scalar product uh, is a complex number. So it's a number, not a state anymore. And this still give you a, uh, 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 give you another uh, cat vector. So that's why this is an uh, operator. Um, and uh, so um, uh, if we let this psi be a normalized kite vector, normalized means this, okay? Uh, the operator uh, per phi is defined as this. Okay, this is instead of two different vectors, it's the same uh, vector, but one is cat, one is bra. Um, so it's a projector operator that projects any arbitrary cat vector onto the cat vector. Uh, okay, so, so this is, okay. So if I do this, this is another ab arbitrary vector equals this, this, and that. So again, um, this is a, a number, not a vector anymore. So this is to project phi onto psi uh, vector. So if you project it twice in succession onto a given vector is equal to project a single time, you already projected it. This is similar to say in coordinates, you project this to x direction, you project again, it's still in the x uh, di direction there. Um, so for a also normal uh, set, then you have un, un here equals one, if you take the sum of that, okay. Um, so the reason we introduce these projector operator is to say, if you are given uh, any state of psi, um, when you do measurements, we'll talk next, you can only get one of the eigenvalue state. So then how do you uh, derive the probability for that? Is basically a measurement is to project this into one of the eigenvalue, right? So, so let's talk about that. Okay, so um, uh, the next one is the mean value of uh, observable. So the mean value will be given by this. If basically we are, uh, maybe I should write a slightly different way. This is a state psi state sign, A is uh, acting on that, means you are making measurement. So if you make many times of the measurements, eventually you can calculate a mean value, and it is given by this expression. This is true for all possible uh, cases, regardless it's discrete or continuous eigenvalues. It is a natural conclusion from the principle of spectral decomposition. So basically, if the psi, uh, say let's say, psi is uh, given by cn, un, and then uh, you use a uh, act on that, uh, operator a act on that. So every time you will get one of the uh, eigenvalue an, then eventually your mean so let me say this, if I, if I, yeah, if I have A worked on phi, if I do one time measurements, I will get a number of A n. This n could be go from one to any number, right? So you, you will get, you, 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 it's a guarantee that you will get one of the eigenvalues, but uh, which one you get, it's uh, un uncertain. 
So then eventually, if you make many times of these measurements, how would you get the mean value? <coughs> it should be an times the probability to obtain an, and then do the uh, sum of this uh, all the possible an here, right? This is how you will get the mean, and this is exactly equal to what we 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 have there. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean I I will skip how to uh, prove that this is right. It's in the actual notes, so please do read it. The next one is a difficult concept to uh, to to uh, uh, to accept, which is uh, the quantum mechanics called uh, reduction of the state. Or you can say it's the uh, collapse of a state. Say originally your uh, state psi is a, um, a superposition of many eigenstates. But once you make a measurement, you each time you will only get one eigenvalue. So what does that mean? This thing, suddenly the state goes to one of the eigenstates. So you obtain the eigenvalue in. If you immediately make the second measurement after you get AM, means very short time means this state that, that does not even have time to evolve, what would you have? If you immediately make another measurement, exactly, you will, it will remain in the same state and you will get uh, the same eigenvalue. Because once it's in eigenstate, you make the measurement, it will continue to stay in that uh, eigenstate. Okay. Uh, so, um, there's, uh, I mean, this is one of the most difficult uh, uh, concepts for quantum mechanics to convince people. Uh, are you guys aware of a paper called, uh, by EPR? E represents Einstein, Albert Einstein. PR are another two scientists. They published a paper uh, many years ago in 1960s or something, uh, criticized, said that this is not good. This is uh, the incomplete of quantum mechanics. So they were doing some thought experiments, basically saying, if you have two particles somehow becomes uh, entangled, even they are separate, maybe by a kilometer or even long. Uh, originally, they are in superposition state. And you make a measurement on particle one, the particle one suddenly uh, collapses to one eigenstate, and this will affect a, the particle two far away from you, could be 100 kilometers away from you. They said this is impossible. But uh, then there are some papers saying uh, people did some experiments using correlation. Um, eventually, they prove the quantum mechanics prediction is actually right. Yeah, so this uh, collapse of uh, all the reduction of state, is, it, is, uh, it is actually real, physical. Um, you know, another way to say the reason we think it's not acceptable is because we grew up in classical physics world. We accepted those concepts first. But how about if you were born in a quantum mechanics world? Since the beginning, you have all these postulates. You said this is reality, this is something the world works. Then you would accept this. So quant um, in another way to say quantum mechanics principle, it's not something you can derive. Whether it's right or wrong can only be verified by what? Experiments. Similar to why we accept New Newtonian uh, mechanics. We know if you go to really micro world, it's not working. But in the micro world, people did many experiments, and actually his principle summarized from numerous experiments. So within the experiments, we accept it. Yeah. Quantum mechanics also of this concept is a similar way. So in that case, um, let's, uh, let's uh, come back to this. Uh, 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 okay. Come back to this Michelson interferometer. 
I said that there is a two state, right? When the photon, once it, it reaches the beam, uh, beam splitter, it becomes the superposition of a two state. Then they do the interference. But if you try to determine, okay, which way the photon really goes through, transmitted or uh, reflected, you put some photo detector, either here or here, you detect them. Then what happened? The interference pattern here disappear because once you measure, one of the beam won't be able to go through to reach the uh, photo detector. But if you, then okay, then let me ask you this. If I put one photo detector here, one photo detector here, uh, each time you know, will I measure both, photo, I mean both detectors will measure photons? Or you only have one detector measure photons? Which one? Huh? Yes, only one of them will, will, uh, will detect a, a full photon. The other one will be zero. It won't be, say, one detect 50%, the other one de detect 50%. So this is, uh, um, this is the, the, the particle, uh, um, particle wave duality of fo photons. And in this case, the photon originally is in a superposition state. Suddenly, you measure the either on state one or state two, but never the same, uh, not, not, never the simu uh, simultaneously. That is a part of the reduction of the state or the collapse of the state. A superposition state suddenly goes to one state, either quantum uh, state one or quantum state two. Okay, but once you make this measurement, the interference they disappears. Then measurement does uh, interference this. Unlike in the micro world, you can say, if I make the measurement really, really nice, I will not affect the measurement, re the, the, the results. But in micro world, it's not. Measurement always is a disturbance to the our, our original state. Um, so similarly, how about this? Let me ask you this. Uh, oh, okay. So then what's the, pro uh, the probability for photo detector one here, detector two here? Uh, to de detect a photon. If I have a beam splitter 50-50%, yeah, 50-50%. If I give you 20-80%, they transmitted only 20, then you have 20% to detect them, 80% here. So you cannot tell each time which one definitely detect a photon, but you can predict the probability. I have 20% chance if it's 20% uh, transmission there, right? Uh, so this is a, um, these are a very interesting uh, concept here. Um, um, okay, so the next one is, uh, uh, it's, um, how do I say that? I, I, I noticed, them. I changed my teaching several times on this subject. Which one go first, which one go second? Um, Okay, so let me actually jump back. Uh, um, okay, so um, where is this? Okay, so um, talking about this, since we already talked about the interference here, why don't we come back to, okay, so how do you express this uh, such interference in quantum mechanics way. And this is, uh, uh, okay, so let's call it a heaven. This is the quantum probability uh, amplitude, probability amplitude, and uh, interference. So you have gone through those Young's double slate interference and many other things uh, in the textbook. Um, then how do we say, how to express this, say, like this Michelson interferon meter? Um, we'll say we have one state given by psi one, another state given by uh, psi two, and these two are also normal, means 
orthogonal and normalized, which is represented by these two are, 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 are orthogonal. So the scalar product should be zero. But they are normalized. So scalar product with themselves selves, equals one. So if we say the photon uh, reach the uh, beam splitter becomes the superposition of the state, how would you write it? So it form a new state. This new state is given by lambda 1 times psi 1 plus lambda 2 times uh, times psi 2, psi 1, psi 2. Okay, but with uh, uh, some number coefficient, lambda 1, lambda 2 there. Okay. Uh, I wanted to know, so if the system is in state, uh, the probability of finding this and what is measured. I'll consider this. Okay. So, uh, of course, if uh, because these are uh, normalized uh, stuff, so you will have lambda 1 square plus lambda 2 square equals 1. So, because this state, new state, psi, is a superposition of lambda 1 or lambda 2. If you do measurement, they are either in lambda 1 or lambda 2, not outside of them. So when you, then of course the total uh, uh, probability to find them in either lambda 1 or lambda 2 should be 1, right? So this is normalized. Um, and then let's see, uh, the probability uh, P A N of finding eigenvalue A N when the observable A operator is measured on the system in the uh, state of psi is given. Uh, so here, psi 1, psi 2 are two states, but they may not be the eigenvalue state. Uh, so the eigenvalue state is still say they are given by this, and you have a whole complete set there. Okay. Uh, in this case, I tried to say to to calculate the probability for finding this psi new state. You can measure it uh, to, to, to get um, eigenvalue uh, a n. So this corresponding to a n eigenvalue. Okay. You take a probability. It should be given by this the get scalar product and take the uh, square of the um, of the of the mode. So for this, you can do for each one. Um, so you have. So I have. I can write it because this one can be. I, I substitute the psi into here. Then you get uh, lambda 1 un uh, psi 1 plus lambda 2 un psi 2. Okay. You want to take a square of this whole, whole thing. Then. Uh, of course, you can go through the uh, uh, derivation here. Well, I mean, write these results. It becomes lambda 1 square times un psi 1 square plus lambda 2 square. Uh, square. Uh, the reason I use absolute value is uh, it's actually just, uh, just uh, for this. Um, Make sure you get a real number, not a, a complex number. It's not absolute value. It's take the mode of that. So, so if I only have these two terms, there's no interference. One probability plus another probability that doesn't matter, right? The real uh, interference come from the uh, cross term. Okay, so uh, with 
these two cross term. Um, now I can, yeah, this is, uh, I make this, I, I wrote the two big. So the first term you can say is lambda 1 square uh, times P1 an, that's the probability, plus lambda 2 uh, square P2 an, and then plus uh, 2 times, take the real part, lambda 1, lambda 2, uh, conjugate. Okay, so the cross term shows the interference stuff, okay. Yeah, the, this cross term shows the interference uh, effect. Um, so if we go back here, the PAN is equal to the square of this one. So this thing itself is called a probability amplitude because P is a probability and that's amplitude. So the probability amplitude square equals to the probability. And the interference effect uh, is explained by the superposition of the probability amplitude. So basically here, why you have interference? If you do not have the superposition of two amplitude, then you take the square to calculate probability. You won't have interference. If you only had the two probability added together, you won't have interference. So again, although you cannot say uh, in quantum mechanics, they explain this, they are not the really the electromagnetic waves uh, amplitude superposition anymore, but it is the uh, probability amplitude superposition. Then they generate uh, interference a effect there. Um, okay, I think uh, so much for now. Uh, on Thursday, we'll continue for this quantum mechanics, and I hope on Friday we'll add a lecture uh, what time would work for you guys? I, I, I also need to coordinate with them to find out a viable room. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's the morning. Um, I'm going to do an experiment in the afternoon. Oh, sure. I don't think I'll be here, but I can watch the video also. So. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we are done here. Please do go through the lecture notes. I cannot go through.